Good morning, everyone. I'm Louise Halfpenny, and I'm welcoming you to the Stakeholder Reference Group. This is our second session on clinical strategy. And we will be running it on Zoom, as you know, and in a slight change, we will be accepting questions via the, the chat function, but also um, if you raise your hand, either physically, um, if you can't find the device on the system that allows you to, to raise your hand on the computer, or you use that method, we will also come to you so you can ask your question yourself. We might not always get the order right, so forgive us if you feel that you've been waiting a long time, but we will be keeping an eye on all those who are raising hands and the chat functions, so we will endeavour to get to everybody's question um, at the end of the session or at the end of the presentation from, from Claire and uh, also David. So having mentioned Claire and David, let's have a look at who they are and what, what their jobs are. So there's Claire, you may have heard from her before. She's Director of Strategy and Integration and David is our Deputy Chief Nurse. Good and, morning, everyone. Morning. And uh, without further ado, we will head to Claire and she will introduce the clinical strategy. Thank you, Louise. Um, so as Louise said, I'm Claire Parker and I'm leading the work the Trust is doing at the moment to develop our clinical strategy for the next five to ten years. Um, the executive sponsors of that are Mike uh, van der Watt, the medical director, and Tracy Carter, the um, chief nurse. So it's, it's very much a clinically led piece of work that I'm facilitating and enabling. So we're developing the clinical strategy against a background of a number of existing uh, strategies that we need to be aware of. The first of which is the trust strategy for 2020 to 2025, which we published in February, in which many of you may have been involved um, in inputting into in the work that we did at that time. That sets out for the trust our four key aims of best care, best value, great team and great place. And the purpose of the clinical strategy is really to articulate how we're going to deliver on the best care aim and ambition from our strategy. Um, now, clearly that has links to the others and particularly to great team because we can't deliver best care without a great team. But really what we're looking at is the clinical services and how we improve and, uh, and deliver those differently going forward. The backdrop externally is the NHS long-term plan. Uh, the Five Year Forward View was published a number of years ago and then the long-term plan uh, more recently. That sets out uh, quite clearly a number of changes that the NHS is expected to deliver, which I'll, I'll talk to a bit more um, in, a, in a few moments. We also have Your Care, Your Future, which you may be familiar with, which is our strategy for West Hertfordshire, which we've had for a number of years. And also at the Hertfordshire and West Essex level, we have an integrated health and care strategy for our integrated care system. So those are all things which we need to be aware of and reference as we develop our clinical strategy. So just to be clear about how the strategy fits in uh, more widely to the work we're doing around the redevelopment. So the, as I say, the starting point is the overall trust strategy from which we are now focusing um, on the clinical strategy, which is what we will be talking about today. That then feeds down and informs the clinical brief for the redevelopment, which then further informs the site strategy. So we are not today talking about where we're going to be delivering services or how that works across the different sites or anything to do with the redevelopment. The focus for today is purely on the clinical services that we think we can need to deliver and how we build and improve on those and improve the quality of those services. So just moving on, I reference the NHS long-term plan. That sets out five key changes to the model of care that the NHS is expected to deliver over the next five years. So boosting out of hospital care so that much more happens in the community um, and how primary care and, and community services work together redesigning and reducing pressure on emergency hospital services, having more personalised care, which is really focusing on the um, outcomes and goals that individual people want to achieve, as opposed to necessarily those that, uh, that clinicians might want to achieve for them. Digitally enabled primary and outpatient care, which is something that um, we've had to really develop in response to the COVID pandemic and where we're now actually delivering a significant amount of our outpatient care virtually as a result. 
and more of a focus on population health. So not just now about how we treat people once they've become ill, but much more focus on how we stop people from getting ill in the first place, which again, I think that the, uh, the COVID pandemic has really brought into, um, into to the highlight because um, you know, we have seen that people who are healthier have tended to, uh, to survive COVID much better. So just again, um, a bit more detail in terms of the long term plan, and I won't go through all of this, but there are a number of specific ambitions and commitments within the NHS long term plan that we need to be aware of and planning to deliver. Um, so just picking out cancer, for example, at the moment, survival rates in the UK are not as good as, as some of the other developed countries, and that's because we actually diagnose people at a relatively late, late stage. So the long term plan is um, looking at how we diagnose more people earlier in their pathway and therefore to support 55,000 more people to survive cancer for at least five years by 2028. It also starts to look at how we use things like genomics to deliver medicine that's more personalised to individuals. So understanding the genes of an individual and how they are therefore more likely to respond um, to different treatments. So that will start with children, but again, that will roll out and I'm sure will become a big part of medicine over the next few years. Other commitments relate to things like maternity, so improving maternal health and reducing stillbirth, improving the, uh, the integration of maternity so that you have continuity of care from uh, antenatal through birth to postnatal. Um, and so then some commitments around personalised care and out of hospital care as well. So we've been doing a lot of work within the trust, engaging with the clinicians um, who have come up with a number of emerging themes for the strategy, which we want to test today. So the first is that, as I've mentioned already, there's a lot of things have changed in the way that we are delivering care during COVID and we want to learn from that. So some of those things are not optimal and we will want to go back to normal when we can, but actually some things such as the way we've introduced a respiratory virtual hospital to support people at home that have had COVID has actually been very positive and has um, prevented admissions and enabled people to, to stay well at home. So lots of things we want to build on um, that have been more positive outcomes from what's been a very difficult experience. Secondly, we already have a number of areas of excellence within the hospital that we want to develop and build on. So we want to make sure that we can give the best possible services local to people's homes. And if we can deliver more here that stops people having to move into London for more, um, more specialist services, then that's something we want to do where that's safe and clinically appropriate to do so. Another learning from COVID has been that um, we don't always need to make people travel to our hospital to deliver our expertise. Um, so I think that's been the historical model that the patient always comes to the doctor, but actually through a lot of our virtual work, we found we can make that expertise available to people in their own homes or in community settings. So in the future, we would look to make sure that people only have to travel to our hospitals if they actually need the facilities, um, such as needing to have some form of radiology diagnostic scan, or if they actually do need to see their uh, clinician face to face for, for good clinical reasons. Um, we want to have more integration, both within the hospital, between different hospital services. So, for example, how we um, support uh, people who are pregnant through pregnancy with more uh, medical support, um, for example, um, around things like diabetes, but also more integration into the community so that our acute services are more joined up with primary care and community. As I've mentioned um, already, we want to personalise care more um, and there's lots of work that we can do there. Again, we have some great areas of existing practice, um, but more we can do to, to roll that out and make that more consistent across the hospital. There are lots of ways that digital solutions and technology can improve outcomes and we want to build upon those. Um, the first thing we're doing is, is implementing an electronic patient record and from that we will be able to build um, many more things that will help and support uh, people to, to stay well. We have a number of workforce challenges like everyone in the NHS does and there are lots of ways where we could be creating new roles to help us to address those. Um, so linking with our workforce strategy we will be looking at how we can develop new roles and improve our education and training to support people and attract them into our hospital. 
And then finally, uh, we more and more are reliant on diagnostics to help us to determine the uh, what's wrong with people and the care that they need to have. And so we need to build more diagnostics um, into uh, the way that we practice medicine and make more capacity available, again, with appropriate workforce to deliver that. So the strain work, uh, sorry, the strategy is going to be built upon a framework. Um, so with our heading of best care from our overall strategy, we want to deliver high quality services with areas of excellence. We're going to do that by changing our new care models, working in partnership through more integrated care, more personalised care and more consistent care. So that whoever you see at whatever time of the day of the week, um, the care that you receive will be consistent and protocol based. And that will be clinically led and enabled by our supporting strategies around digital people, diagnostics, and then work around business process redesign. Because we know that often the care that we provide is really good, but the patient experience, particularly in terms of things like communications and um, some of our written documentation is much less good. Um, so lots of work we can do there to improve both patient and staff experience. What we're planning to do for the strategy is to have some very explicit ambitions. Um, so we're still working on these, but we've just got some examples here. So an ambition around how we will provide that best care, ambitions around how we will integrate across primary and community services, how we will personalise the care we deliver, and how we will standardise that to get the consistent outcomes and best pathways. So more work we'll be doing on these ambitions, um, but that's the, that's the direction that we want to take. And then similarly for those supporting strategies I mentioned, we will have clear ambitions around those. And all of that will then be supported by some measurable objectives over the next one, three, five, ten years to show how we're going to deliver those ambitions um, as, a, as a provider and with our partners. So um, we're going to go now into a question and answer session. And as um, Louise said, because we, we are seeking to, to make this as um, interactive as possible, it's obviously very difficult to do engagement around the strategy um, in the current environment. Um, but we do want to, to get your thoughts and questions about this. So any questions you have on, in terms of what I've said, but we are particularly interested to know whether the organising themes that we've come up with of integration, personalisation and consistent care are the right themes. Um, and is there anything that we're missing? You know, are our ambitions going in the right direction and, and what should be in there that we've not included or that I haven't mentioned, but which is important to you? So I think Louise will, will chair the session and David and I will, will do our best to, um, to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. So quite a lot to take in there, but I hope you get an understanding from what Claire has said that as we are moving through plans towards redevelopment, towards new hospital buildings. We are taking our clinical workforce with us. The sessions that are being held with the clinicians um, are increasing in numbers of attendees, the depth of the conversation, really getting into thinking about service models now, how to embrace the latest technology and the lessons from COVID. So it, it sounds theoretical in some ways, uh, some of the information that that Claire has given you, but actually she is working with others, with David, uh, with senior nursing colleagues and our doctors to really bring to life um, a lot of what you've heard today. So the questions that we have for you um, are around integrated care, personalised care and consistent care. Do you think they're the right themes? And do you think we are missing out on anything? So in this session, we would really appreciate questions around the clinical strategy and we would also very much appreciate your time after the session because we will be sending out a very short questionnaire. So um, you, as I said you've, you've got the option in this session to ask questions either in person or via the chat function and we will try to keep it um, democratic by going around to people in the order in which they ask the questions, but please forgive us if we, if we don't. Um, I don't have any yet on the chat function, so you would send them to me, Louise Halfpenny, and I will pick them up from the chat function. And I'm just having a look to see if I can see any waving of hands, either physically or by using the little hand sign. And I can't 
at the moment. Oh, I can actually, I can see Sue there. So if we can make sure that Sue is unmuted and then she can ask us her, her question. So uh, you can unmute yourself actually, Sue. I don't know if you know, that's it, brilliant. Okay, off you go. Okay, I did try on the chat, but I don't think it worked. <laughs> um, um, having been a patient uh, who was in the corridor of uh, Watford General Hospital at one stage, it's a very uncomfortable place. And um, I wondered how the Trust plans to deal with bed shortages in the future. Um, I know a lot of, the, of what you've talked about is about the community, and I understand the need for that. And um, it, it probably is very good to have diagnostics outside and those kind of strategies. Um, but we are looking at um, an increase in population, um, especially in Hemel, because there's going to be a lot of new building, um, and also the increase in elderly who need more um, treatments in hospital, possibly, than, than outside. So I wondered... Um, at, the, at the moment, you're using Hemel sometimes, and you're using private hospitals. Um, when the building is built, will there be enough beds? Thank you. Um, David, did you want to start with that? And I think Claire would also like to come in, because I know looking at pathways is, is really um, a lot of the work that you've been doing, and that will... I think touch on Sue's question about care for the elderly. So, David, if we can ask yeah, you certainly. to address beds and then move on to Claire. I mean, that uh, what an excellent uh, opening question, and I think it's something that, as an organisation, we take extremely seriously. Uh, do we have a big enough hospital? Do we have enough beds? How do we work together? All these uh, are being worked at at the moment to look at specific uh, beds. Uh, percentages of increase in population. So all these factors uh, are being taken into consideration. With part of that on a clinical aspect is looking at what future developments we're having. So within the clinical strategy, it's working within our primary and secondary care and volunteers uh, sectors in looking at how our pathways are streamlined, are efficient, we, as an organisation, have a commitment within the integrated care partnerships to work together. And therefore, instead of being hospital-based, it should be community-based, a lot of the care that's being provided. So there's a shift that's being there, and this is being some managerial speak here, some capacity and demand modelling to be able to understand exactly what you said, Sue, in meeting that demand and future demand. We work that in partnership. We work in looking at specific pathways. So it could be a diabetes has been mentioned before with care of the elderly, looking at what development. So from a national point of view, we work with nationally, we work with regionally, we work with local, and we work with the community to try and understand the most efficient way of keeping you safe, keeping our patients safe, in the best possible way, best possible way. Claire, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, so I, I thought I might give a few specific examples as well, okay. which might just um, just help to give some sort of sense of some of the ways that actually some of the pathway changes we're describing can make a real difference. So, um, so first off, just looking at a couple of things we saw during the COVID period. So the, the virtual hospital, respiratory virtual hospital that we introduced, um, was to basically prevent what we what we saw was a lot of people were coming in with symptoms of COVID and being admitted, but not actually necessarily needing any kind of oxygen support, and therefore they could be um, looked after at home if they were having the right monitoring done and the right access to expertise. So that was the model that was implemented, which was um, overseen by our acute cl clinicians, but was working in partnership with the community. And that enabled around 1500, I think was the last number I saw, um, people to be managed safely at home and only around 8% of those actually needed to be admitted to the hospital in the end. So that made quite a substantial impact. What we've also done at the, at the other end, once people have been admitted, is to improve how we get people home. Um, so moving away from a model where people are assessed in the hospital to a way in which they're assessed in their own home environment, which actually 
helps people to recover better um, and make sure that any package of care they needed is better tailored to them in their own environment. And what we saw through that was an 11% reduction in length of stay for those non-COVID patients who had um, had that service. Um, other examples, we have an integrated diabetes service um, and uh, through that work in particular, some focus they've done on preventing people from needing to have um, amputations by better care and better foot care, that's seen more than 50% reduction in admissions for that particular patient cohort. Um, the other thing that we were doing within the hospital before, uh, before the COVID um, pandemic was something called SMART, which was about how we made sure that we had physicians at the front door of ED who are actually doing specialist assessments um, and much earlier in people's pathway. And that both reduced the number of people who needed to be admitted to the hospital and reduced the length of stay by 0.7 days for those patients because they were getting an early plan for how they would be cared for during the hospital, which meant that that plan was implemented more quickly and they were able to leave more quickly. So we know both through things we can do within the hospital and things we can do working with our partners in the community that we can have an impact on both the number of people that are admitted and the length of stay they have in hospital. But we do also completely accept that we are, are overcrowded at the moment, that our, um, our occupancy is too high, that that leads to a poor patient experience. And as David said, we are absolutely planning for an increase in the number of beds in the new hospital. And that is part of the planning that we're doing at the moment um, as part of our outline business case. So we would expect that to be addressed once we've got those new facilities. I think to add to that, if I may, is that it's really important once patients are in the hospital that they get the best care possible. And I think what is happening on the wards, just to get a little bit of a flavour, is we have multidisciplinary team meetings. We have specialist consultants. And this is actually trying to, one, get the best care, the right care every time, first time, but also to make sure that people aren't in the hospital longer than they should be. Patients want to be at home, and I sometimes feel we do disservice to people when we keep people longer than they should be. So getting the right diagnostics at the right time for, be able, for medical colleagues and nursing colleagues to have the full information at the right time to be able to reduce that length of stay, for get, to be able for patients to be got home and then supported at home. So I think with the efficiencies that we have, with the modeling capacity we have, with the working together in primary and secondary care and voluntary sectors, I think the modelling will be the best we possibly can, can make it. Thank you. Thank you, David. And can I ask you, because I've, I've heard a figure that Sally uh, Tucker, our, our um, operations director, has used before about corridor care, which is something that we all hate which it sounds like sue experienced and i think now we have gone is it for over a year or even longer without having any patients in the corridor at, uh, in our a e department is that is that about right um that's exactly right i think it's really important that this for patient experience to be a corridor is absolutely just um everybody agrees is, is wrong and therefore with the developments in the organization already through ED, so our emergency department and funding that's come through that, we've had areas that can support patients more. So I think with the developments of ED, emergency department, with what Claire's mentioned about a medical model of SMART, so getting the right people there with the right skills to make the decisions and working with our partners. So for instance, our ambulance and working with communities, then people don't need to come into ED. And with the developments of our uh, UTC model within uh, Watford, I think that all supports uh, patients getting to the right place at the right time and not being in corridors. And you're absolutely right, Louise, that, that supports our initiatives, has supported with the outcomes of not having patients in our corridors. Thank you, thank you. And just to say, we have to, we have talked about extra beds. We have given a number in the past, Sue. It might change again as we look at the statistics. So I think we have we have said around seventy extra beds. It might be more. It might be less. Uh, we are trying to use beds less anyway for 
all the reasons that you've heard. Um, can I just could I just add yeah, then, Louise, if I may, because I think there's different models that we're trying to look at, and what we're trying to do is within our emergency department have clear assessment areas. So having the right assessment areas to be able to then people get specialist care and being able then to, if required, to be admitted, but actually to have the support mechanisms for people to get back into the community as soon as possible. So having very efficient, very uh, clinically led assessment areas supports that, supports everything we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, David. And of course, we're very interested in all the latest science around single occupancy rooms and the benefit that they may have. I don't think it's totally proven around infection control, but we're looking at a much higher percentage of single occupancy rooms in the new model. So um, we've had a question coming in from Jeff, and it's one that we've had on previous sessions, and it's about digital communication. We have talked a lot about the, um, the level of care and the really high volume of patients who we've been able to look after whilst they have been at home. And we've done that through IT, through monitoring systems, a um, whole range of, of technology and in some cases devices, which mean that we can really carefully monitor, monitor those patients. But that doesn't mean that we have to treat people in that way. So for those patients who don't get on with technology, we will also always make an exception. So I know when you talk about digital, a lot of people worry for those that they may know who, who really don't get to grips with digital technology. It's not going to be compulsory, but we are finding it has made a huge difference to our efficiency and for those patients who've been able to remain at home to their comfort and their own patient experience, but it is not compulsory. Um, I think I'll just add to that, Louise. I think we had a discussion yesterday within the clinicians and clearly there will be a bigger percentage that uh, don't have face-to-face, -face, but there will be face-to-face -face outpatient um, sessions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Elizabeth, you've been very patient. Um, I know you've had your hand up. So if, uh, if you can unmute yourself, uh, we're ready for your question. Okay, one of my questions, I had an experience a few years ago, I had breast cancer. And on the day of my surgery, I had to go to, I live in North Watford, I had to go to St. Albans Hospital for a pre-op procedure at seven o'clock in the morning. So public transport wasn't an option. I then had to get from St. Albans Hospital to Watford General for surgery. So that was quite uh, stressful mm -hmm. on that particular day. And I had to pay for taxis. What has been put in place to prevent, you know, similar things? I don't drive, I live alone, so it was an absolute necessary for me to have taxis on standby, etc. And as I say, like I managed, I was okay, but it can be quite traumatic to have to do all of that and then have to face surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I, first of all, I hope everything is, is working out well for you. I'm um, doing fine. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good. Good. And I am sorry to hear of your experience. We are acutely aware of that pathway for um, breast cancer patients and it is going to be a top priority in how we change that. So we've been looking very carefully at the services that we would run from St Albans and from Hemel Hempstead and how they would interact with services at Watford if that is the model that is chosen um, with um, precisely the, re you know, we are driven by the reason um, to, to make that pathway really simple so that you go to one hospital and you have as much done as possible at one time. We, we really know that that pathway is problematic. Similarly, urology patients have to make lots of trips and we are working to make that what we call a one-stop shop. So mm -hmm. we know that that's difficult and we are really going to tackle it. Um, in terms of transport, we will be setting up a transport and access group with input from the local authority and we will also get that 
independently chaired and facilitated so that whatever the, um, op the preferred option is that we choose, we can make sure that we are working with the transport providers to make it much easier. And there is, of course, the volunteer driver scheme. So a lot of work for us to do on transport and access. But before we do that, we must really pay attention to our patient pathways. And I know that Claire and, and David will be able to add to my assurance that that's a top priority. So, um, David, if we can go to you first. Um, to, yeah, to yeah answer I mean, that. I, I think it's vital we, that we have these kind of sessions to hear the voices of uh, our community and patients. And I think it's absolutely vital that this is a priority for patient experience. And I can guarantee and absolutely assure you that it is on the height of my agenda and both myself and Tracy Carter and Mike uh, and the board as a whole about patient experience. These kind of things, as Louise has mentioned, are uh, we are aware. We are working within our services to try and have those one stop. But it is vital that not just within the service, so I'm going to talk as a whole organization now, that we listen to our patients. And therefore, I can guarantee that our friends and family tests, our co-production pieces of work, which we're working with our communities, we will listen to people's uh, views, concerns, and work with individuals in a partnership, involvement and engagement to be able to understand it. We may not be always be able to manage it there and then, but I want to be able to have that communication to say, these are the problems and these are why we're trying to work it. So I think it's that honest, open, trust communication with our communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and Claire, did you want to um, add anything on that pathway work that would, that would prevent Elizabeth from having that kind of experience in the future or, or any of our patients? Um, so I have to, I'm not well cited on the, the breast cancer pathway um, itself, but I mean, clearly it's not acceptable to be going to two sites on the same day, particularly on a day when you're needing surgery. So I, th I think a lot of what we're trying to do in terms of the way that we consolidate services and arrange things differently is to avoid that from, from being necessary. Um, so yeah, I certainly, I, I don't think any of us would agree that that's a good pathway for anybody. I think to add to Claire's comments then, uh, Elizabeth and, and everyone on the call, uh, diagnostics is uh, one of the priorities for the uh, development. Diagnostics is such an important aspect uh, for giving medical teams the information to give correct diagnosis and treatment. And therefore it is a priority and the um, I, I, I think I'll just leave it there. It is a priority that I'm hearing that conversation in every meeting I'm going to. So uh, please be reassured that uh, we're taking these comments seriously and working towards really the best care we can possibly uh, give. Thank you. And certainly diagnostics is something that, that we would seek to invest in at St Albans and at Hemel Hempstead. Um, and just to uh, go back to the questions about beds and hospitals, um, Sue mentioned about care in the private sector or using private sector beds. Um, and just to um, give you an update on that, we were looking recently, I think, it, um, to respond to a media query about use of the private sector. So we have used the private sector for our cancer patients. Um, ever since the, the pandemic started, really, we've worked with Spire Bushy to um, treat our most urgent cancer patients and, and others who have an urgent need for surgery. And we've treated over 1,500 patients in that way. So we're not ashamed of using the private sector uh, when, we, when we need to. And for us, it was an ideal solution because we were very concerned about having those patients in our hospital uh, at Watford at the time that we had a lot of COVID-19 uh, patients and that has really changed the way that we look at hospitals so uh, we're using um, the phrases green and blue and we are trying to keep St Albans or create St Albans as a green site and that means a clean site a COVID free site and that will really shape the kinds of services that we run from there 
and the emphasis on that site will be um, on surgery and on, and on diagnosis. So we're learning a lot from COVID, but we will use the private sector when we need to, and it's certainly been a huge relief for those 1,500 or so patients that have been able to have their surgery done on a very clean site in Bushy. So um, I don't have any more questions on the chat, so I'm having a look to see if anyone is raising any hands. I can't raise there. the hand. Oh, is that Edith? Edith? It is. I can't, I can't get, I've tried chat. Okay, I'm not seeing <laughs> no your chat, but we, but we can hear you. So go, so go <laughs> ahead, Edith, come on. <laughs> What's well, your question? To ask. One thing I'd like to know is, actually, if you decided how many single rooms you're going to have, because that's going to be important in the future uh, for infection control. Um, yep. What do you mean uh, by more diagnostics at Hemel? Um, and St Albans and the other thing is patient involvement I haven't this is the first time throughout this whole process of redevelopment that there's been any talk about the clinical strategy um, and it's a little bit late and I found that the presentation was far too rushed to take it in and to be able to respond in a meaningful way so how are you involving us as patients and public. And the other thing is, I'm very anxious about the lessons you are learning from COVID. Um, having had experience of both um, virtual, virtual um, appointments or consultations, um, it's actually much harder for the patient uh, you may not realise it, uh, but it's, be it's become apparent to me um, that you take in even less of what a consultant is saying on a virtual um, appointment than you do face to face. And I know even face to face, you don't do terribly well remembering what's occurred. So I think I think that's um, a start. <laughs> That is, that is definitely a start, Edie. Shall so, I pick those? I can, I'm happy to pick those up. Yeah. Okay, I can pick okay. a few so things I, up with the clinical aspect. With, so if I start, start with, with the beds. last one in terms of the lessons from COVID. Um, so there, clearly there were lots of things that we needed to do because of the, the pace of the pandemic that we just had to make changes and which we would absolutely recognise that we did not do in any kind of co-produced way or with involvement of patients. Um, and that was just a, a clinical necessity it, given the environment in which we were working. But we also know that that therefore means we can't just assume that everything we've done is right and can carry on exactly the way it is without getting some of that um, some of those patient experiences brought into that uh, to that learning so what we are doing is there are a number of areas which we are actively looking to assess the impact and to include within that patient experience staff experience looking at outcomes um, looking at inequalities and impact on, on different populations to make sure that any decisions we make about the future long-term services um, are, are reflective of that so that includes the virtual consultation work we've done it also includes um, the discharge to assess pathways which I've already referenced um, the virtual respiratory hospital um, and a number of different things the I mean different people have experienced it differently so some people have loved virtual consultations other people haven't um, that's some of what we need to learn and understand um, and to, to, to see where it is most appropriate and where it is not appropriate um, so it, it you know it, it will take us a while to get all of that right and, and again engagement at the moment is more difficult but we are actively trying to make sure that we do capture as much of that feedback as possible so that our long-term decisions um, have got uh, that patient experience fully reflected through them. I'd love to, I'd love to respond and get the opportunity. Yeah, sorry, I, yeah, I, yeah, I was going to go through the other points, but yeah, do you want to, should we pause on that no, one? No, no, I just need, you know, be nice to be involved in some way. Okay, yeah, yep, okay, we can pick that, I'll feed that to the person who's um, leading on that work. We've not been involved on that side. No, and like I say, we're only really a sort of starting that now. It's it's not something that we have got very far with, but that's that's what we are trying to do over the next um, the next couple of months. Um, 
in terms of some of the other points and i'm conscious that you know we're trying to focus on the strategy today rather than the redevelopment because the strategy doesn't really look at the redevelopment but um you're absolutely right in in an ideal world we would have had a very clear um develop the clinical strategy first and then have used that to inform the clinical brief and the uh the site strategy for the redevelopment um it hasn't been possible to do that we we have the opportunity of the money that is available to us um, and we have to act very fast to be able to do everything we need to do to secure that money and deliver the new hospital by 2025 um, and if we don't do that then we risk losing the money so we have had to do the two things much more in parallel than we would have wanted to do um, otherwise um, but we have been trying to closely link the work that Esther Moores has been leading around um, the clinical model and the different conversations that have been happening with that and which I think have come here previously um, with the work that we're trying to do in the strategy but the strategy itself is much less focused on the um, the where do we deliver things um, other than trying to look at what needs to be in an acute setting versus a community setting um, and much more focused on on what should we be doing and how do we do it well um, and what what scale do we need um, but just just in terms of the points you raised about the redevelopment um, so we haven't decided on a final number on the single beds yet at the moment we're, we're working on some assumptions um, maybe in the sort of 75 80 percent kind of range but we know it will be at least 50 and it, there are some areas where it's not clinically appropriate to have single beds so it will be less than 100 so um, but at the moment we're still going through the process of determining what is the most appropriate number of single beds and, and how that works in the model um, and as I mentioned, we, you know, we, we are looking at our diagnostics strategy to be really clear to make sure that we understand uh, what, what diagnostics we need to have um, to make sure we've got enough available to support the, the demand that we've got from our population. And we know that that demand is growing um, at a very high rate and that our starting point as a country is much lower than the average uh, for um, OECD mm. countries. Um, so we know that we want to de develop more diagnostics, particularly on the St Albans site, but we will be making sure that there are appropriate diagnostics on all our sites to meet the needs and to fit with the services that are being developed on the different sites. Um, I think you had one other point as well, which is just what came in my mind and went out of it again. You want to just have a think while well, I just talk about a little bit of a bed situation, um, just to give some indication of what thought process is already in. These haven't been signed off. These haven't been agreed. It's just the thought processes of what we're, how the ward layouts will be. Um, if you're talking about single rooms, that's absolutely right. And I think it's really important for uh, future proofing for infections, etc. So to some extent, you would expect say in your elective orthopedic wards, you would have more side rooms than others to try and maintain that surgical priority for infection. But other areas, as we said, would have more uh, areas, uh, less side rooms. So for instance, you'd have four bedded bays. So if you've all been to the hospitals today, you would generally see a six bedded bay and people have got to walk out, go and find a bathroom, etc. So clearly the designs that in my mind, again, this is my mind, is will be moving forward, is it will be a four bedded bays with toilet and shower facilities. And within that ward area, we're looking at 50% plus of uh, side rooms. So there are the sort of conversations we're ha happening. And in the round to say, actually, have we got enough side rooms to future proof um, infections etc so clearly what i would like to do uh, with you all is just to reassure you that that conversation is very much happening at senior and junior level understanding the infection see what's coming forward and looking at the best design uh, to manage infection control but one of the most important thing is education education for our staff and education for our patients to have good hand hygiene good ppe and within those four bedded bays, there will be more space. So it will be, um, it won't be crowded areas. So for infections to cross uh, will be more difficult. So there's a lots of things that we're trying to look at, uh, how patients flow through the hospital, just to stop any infection. So 
really top priorities. So I just wanted to give you a snippet on what our thought processes are at the moment. I've remembered what the other point was. So it was about the speed of presentation. So um, I apologise if that was a bit faster than you were able to take in. Um, I, I think we had hoped to publish it in advance. So I don't know if that happened or not. No. But I just wonder whether it's worth putting back up the slide that has the framework for the strategy so that that's just in front of people and I could just give a quick reminder of what our thoughts are around that because that might just be be helpful if, if you didn't feel you had the uh, the time to take that in. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, is that something you could just um, put up for us if we can just go back to the presentation? I think the, the, if I think if we go back to the one with the framework and I could maybe just give a bit more detail about the different areas within that framework that might just be helpful for the conversation. Thank you. And also while we're waiting for that to happen, I wondered, David, if you could just talk a little bit about patient involvement. I know Edie was saying that she feels that we haven't really uh, come to her yet, but we we haven't been having lots of conversations in in, in private we just ha we're just sort of formulating thoughts and we are now beginning to think about how we might involve patients so perhaps you'd like to say something about the co-production um, board that you're that you've set up oh i think you're just on mute david we'll come back to you david after we've just um thank just you sorry claire... i'm just on mute yeah claire right. do you want to and then i'll, I'll go in I'll... absolutely claire Okay, well, should I let me just go through the, the key bits in this then. So looking at the first slightly darker blue box, the high quality services with areas of excellence. Um, so, so the sorts of things we're thinking about here is that we, we are a DGH and we want to make sure that the services we're providing are as good as possible. So at, at the one end of the spectrum, we've got some services that are already over and above what you'd expect to see in a normal district general hospital. Um, so, for example, we are market leaders in laparos laparoscopic surgery for colorectal. Um, we've got a very wide range of services in places like cardiology and respiratory and urology, um, where we've got really well um, thought of services, really good clinicians. And actually, we have patients traveling into London for some, um, some things that actually we think we could do really well at our site that would reduce um, the, the amount of travel that people need to do. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got some services where they're relatively small with either small numbers of clinicians or small numbers of procedures, which means that it can be more difficult for us to deliver good out of hours care. In some places, we've got services that are being delivered by consultants from other hospitals because we don't have any consultants ourselves. And so we, we also want to make sure that the things we're delivering, we are doing as well as possible. And if there are things that actually we, we can't do as well as we would like to, we might be better off stopping them than or, or at least forming a network approach with another local provider so that we can make those even better. Um, so, so those are the types of things we're, we're looking at in that, um, that first area. In terms of integration, um, I, I mentioned earlier the integrated diabetes service. So that's been a service where we are working closely between um, our hospital with community services, primary care and so on, so that we're identifying um, those people that uh, have got diabetes. They then have access to a multidisciplinary team who can support and look after them and um, try and ensure that we keep them as healthy as possible with more education so that they can manage serve their their uh, their condition better and with earlier intervention that means that we've been able to reduce the number of people that have had to have for example amputations of their feet because we've been able to care for them better through a much better service and there are lots of places particularly in terms of long-term conditions where if we work better between primary community and um, acute and mental health as well we can um, we can make better better outcomes for those people help them to understand their condition better help them to manage it better and to know when things are starting to go wrong so that we can um, intervene earlier so there are lot, lots of things in that space that we want to do um, to do better and to take more of a role where actually we outreach from the trust into the community in the way that we deliver that care in terms of personalized care 
Um, I think that the historical model has been a fairly patriarchal type model where, you know, the consultant knows best and um, and that uh, the power balance between the consultant patient relationship hasn't always been even. I think our good clinicians that has already changed and it's a much more two way conversation with an equal power between the patient and the consultant with the patient sufficiently informed to make decisions about their own care and what they do or don't want to have happen to them. Um, but there's much more we can do there and particularly making sure that we're looking at the outcomes that are important to the individual. So, um, a good example um, that our chief executive quotes is when when she had, um, had broken her ankle and was going to the physio, the physio said to her, what is it that you want to be able to achieve? And she was able to say, I want to be able to walk to the station. I want to be able to walk on a, on the beach. Um, and they were then able to tailor um, the recovery and how they um, how they work with her to make sure that she was able to achieve her own goals. We're also looking at things like patient initiated follow up which won't be appropriate for everybody or in every setting, but actually, um, you know, lots of people have surgery and then come back for a follow-up and actually things are going very well and they don't re really need to go back. Whereas um, for other people, they something might go wrong earlier than their appointment and actually getting access to somebody more quickly initiated by the patient might be a, a better outcome for them and, and similarly for people with long-term conditions. So lots, lots we want to do there to, to really focus more on the, the wants and needs of our, our patients rather than um, the organisational focus that we maybe have had more historically. And then in terms of consistent care, um, we do have differences in the way that different people practice medicine or what happens at a weekend versus during the week and so on. Um, and um, some hospitals have addressed that by having much more protocol led care that make sure that people are getting the right diagnostics for what's happening to them. So you reduce the number of unnecessary diagnostics and make it more likely you will get the right things to, to support and help and make sure you get the right outcomes. And that can be overridden by, um, by clinicians if that's appropriate in individual circumstances, but it does um, give them a, a clear protocol to follow to, to uh, lead to the best outcomes in theory. So those are the sorts of things that we're trying to explore in the strategy. Um, and we think that that fits with the NHS long term plan and we think that fits with what we need to do to, to make our services better um, for our, our patients. Um, and I guess that's the bit we really wanted to test in terms of is there anything missing there or things that are important to you that we haven't thought about um, in those, those sort of more headline levels. Um. David, we, can I ask you just to be super quick on patient involvement? I know it's a huge topic and I don't need to be so glib because it's important, no, no, but no, we've, no, got no. Other we've got other people waiting as well. Thank you. No problem at all. I, I will be as quickly as possible. So as an organisation, we tried to understand more our engagement and involvement. We had patient panel, we had various contacts we had, but we felt that we could improve that engagement. We discussed with our CCG and how they get patient involvement. But what has come, I supported, uh, supported with uh, Health Watch Hertfordshire. We've produced a co-production board, 23 members of varying areas. For instance, we've got community action decorum, citizens advice. Uh, we've got communities first, Groundwork UK, Mind, Care by Us. Hertfordshire, uh, Health Watch, these are the kind of people who are on the board. The intention is that the board will look at projects that we can take forward in supporting that involvement and engagement piece of work. At the moment, we're looking at visitation, looking at property. These are the kind of things that the people in the communities want to uh, be involved with. What will happen is that particular information will go out to all communities. So if you've got an issue that you want to raise, you can by all means come to us, but you can go to these individual areas where you would normally do. So Health Watch, uh, Citizens Advice, they will be part of that and they'll relay some of the message to the board. This is a co-production board. From that, the board will decide at what stage we can look at projects to work together 
And then this could be from just leaflets that we send out to people saying, is this the right message? Or it may be actually co-designing what Elizabeth said there about a breast uh, path care pathway and saying getting 10 or 11 people in who've actually had those experiences and learn from them. And then we can then work with our clinicians to understand it further. That is co-production in two minutes, which is very rare for me to give two minutes explanation on that. Thank you very much, David. Very impressed. Now, Steve, um, we are coming to you. So we're just going to, you can unmute, unmute yourself, Steve, and go ahead with your question. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Day from Hearts Valley Hospital, in case uh, Claire and um, David haven't come across me previously. Two questions. First question to do with beds. Following up from Sue's question earlier, um, I've heard three versions of how many beds there's going to be. Helen previously has said there's going to be no increase in beds. That was at the last public event in, um, in Bushy in, I believe, September, October last year. That was based on the SOC. Um, Claire has said there's going to be an increase and Louise has said there's going to be 70. So clearly at the moment, there's no consensus within the trust as to how many beds you're going to have or you're going to need. Um, but that's not the issue for me. The issue is that you're still basing your projections on the current population based on the census and the Office of National Statistics data. And I keep saying this to people and people keep patting me on the head and going, yeah, don't worry, Steve, we'll take care of it. But the problem is the Office of National Statistics data is based on how many people are alive today on the electoral roll living. It then projects what if five of those have kids and three of those don't, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't take into account the massive expansion that you're seeing in Watford, Hemel, St Albans, everywhere that's going to increase the population by something like 20%. Now, it's all very well saying we've got a great electronic patient management record system and we're going to get people looked after in the community and we're going to not put people in hospital if they, unless they're seriously ill. That's brilliant. I would expect that to be business as usual. But that is not going to deal with a 20% increase in the population. So unless you guys very quickly take on board the data that's in the local plan, all you're doing in this current programme is to scale your organisation to the, a population that is already um, not able to serve because it doesn't have any beds. Can somebody give me a straight answer in less than two minutes? Because I've got a second question on how you're going to deal with that. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. So just to just to um, address the issue of beds, we don't have a definitive number at this stage. That is not where we are in the programme. We're working on it. We will take on board the latest information. Uh, we will take on population information and also look at projections. House building doesn't always equal um, additional people. Sometimes it's the same people in a town or city relocating but we will look at all the information before we make that decision please don't be worried that you've heard different things from different people it doesn't mean there's no consensus it means that we are still looking at that so that is the that is the best answer that I can give you it is a work in progress as you would expect for a program at this particular stage so we don't just look at ONS we use ONS and we also use additional growth on top of that so we're absolutely aware of um, of issues around housing projections and other things that drive demand so it's not just ONS thank you and just as we've got a couple of minutes should we go to your second question Steve yeah I just want to follow up on that Claire you you said um you take other data on board but does that actually look at the local plans in the areas so we've, we've looked at lots of things so um because so no, we've got two minutes yeah so 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 we've we've looked at lots of different ways of looking at this but um we know that historically the growth that we see in the hospital is greater than ons so we are planning over and above the level of ons based on what we've seen in previous um previous places and and taking into it's, I, I can't go into it now because this isn't just designed to be yes about no. hospital. But but so just be assured that there is, and, and it will come out once we you know once we are at a point where we're able to, to share that information in more detail. But okay. we are we are definitely aware of growth over and above ONS and are explicitly building that in based on our best understanding of what is likely to happen. Okay, great, thanks. Second question. I'll make it very quick, and I I've, I've deliberately kept quiet because people sometimes accuse me of 
asking too many questions and being too vocal, but uh, that's why I'm coming on last, um, Louise. So, um, Claire, you, you made a very important point there that um, being the director of strategy, um, you're now making a strategy, but a shortlist has already been made. So, frankly, that's the most amazing admission I've heard in a long time. So, um, I, I just really don't have much else to say other than I wish you all the best in your programme. But if you haven't got a strategy and your redevelopment plan isn't based on the strategy, then it's going to be bad news. That's it. I don't expect to reply. That's it. Thanks. You're on mute, Louise, I think. It's probably a bit unfair to sort of leave it at, at that, to uh, in, uh, throw in a fireball and not expect us to uh, respond. I think Claire will say that the two things can work in tandem, but she's the expert, so I'm going to throw that one over to her. So, so yes, absolutely. So, so as I, I said earlier, the, the, the strategy is much more about how we improve the, the services that we have got. Um, and it is absolutely working in tandem and we've been doing the two things in parallel. Um, but that's, it, it, we have always known the things that we need to do and where the challenges are in our hospital and where we have services that work across multiple sites that, as we've already heard in the example of breast cancer, are not giving a good experience for patients. So site strategy and clinical strategy are not the same thing. Um, you know, they're, they're related, but they're, they have got a different focus. And, um, you know, we, we're absolutely tying this work together. But that isn't where... Um, that, that's not the, the key part for the clinical strategy. The key part is how we really um, improve the outcomes that we're achieving for our patients, irrespective of the site at which we're delivering those services. But this is a redevelopment programme. So, I'm a, a, sorry, a, Steve, but I think, I think Claire, Claire's summing up there really did answer the question. And as we are now at 11 o'clock, um, I'm afraid we need to draw this session Sorry, can I just end. have one quick follow-up, Louise? Uh, well, it's just, it has just gone 11, so... Um... Well, well, sorry, Claire has spent 20 minutes talking and, and I've spent two minutes asking a question, so I think that's only fair. You've let other people have a follow-up. Claire, do you have a moment? I, I have got a moment. Just yeah. a brief, very briefly, Steve, if you would. Yeah, thanks. I, I just find it amazing that um, the, the clinical strategy is considered totally separate from the redevelopment programme. Steve, Claire, Claire, Claire has addressed that point already. So for the benefit of everybody else who was expecting this conversation to last for an hour, I'm afraid I do need to draw it to a close with my thanks to all of you for the questions that you've given us, the time that you've given us, and to Claire and David for joining us today. Please be aware that we have a board meeting ourselves in Hearts Valley's Clinical Commissioning Group next week, and you are very welcome to join that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.